Welcome to Insight. Today we are chatting with Cindy Halberlin, President and CEO of Good360. Good360 is the nonprofit leader in product philanthropy, distributing goods to a network of more than 40,000 charities, schools, and libraries on behalf of America's top brands. Cindy has generously agreed to share some of her experience with us, and I'd like to thank you for joining us today. Thank you. It's my pleasure. Product philanthropy is such an unusual animal. It is not contributing money. It is not contributing services. Let's talk about product philanthropy. What is product philanthropy? Many people refer to it as in-kind gifts. Mm -hmm. What that means is companies, in our case, manufacture or retail thousands and thousands of different products, everything from mattresses to shampoo to clothing to books to technology. And in fact, they can't sell all of it, correct? That's why we see sales. We see, you know, closeouts. That's why there are organizations that sell uh, remainder inventory. What we do in the product philanthropy space is that we take, we create a solution for companies to take those unwanted goods, the goods they can, can not sell, and we give them to people who need them through our e-commerce platform, Giving Place. So our 40,000 plus nonprofits who are all vetted charities can go on 24-7, 365 days a year, search like you would on Amazon or eBay for clothes or personal care or home goods, pick what you need that's critical to your mission, and for a small administrative fee to cover shipping and handling, we'll drop ship those goods to you every day of the week. So this type of contribution actually embeds a huge amount of value into, in, in the form of a product uh, that is, is, um, is contributed to the organization, uh, which allows it to actually leverage each dollar uh, and, and make each dollar go further. That's correct. So take a homeless shelter, for instance. Right. So one of the most critical things you need in a homeless shelter are beds, because people are sleeping there. And so you can get a truckload of Tempur-Pedic mattresses that'll last you 30 years. It's a durable good. It's resistant to bed bugs. It's an incredible investment for one thirtieth of the price it would cost you to go out and purchase mattresses and for linens, your shelter. And, and, and pillows and then clothes for people to come to your shelter for the transition and computers so that they get the skills that they need to roll off into an independent living and a new job and all those aspects are in our marketplace for our nonprofits to serve the needy people that they do around the U.S. and around the world as well. Now these products are top products. They're newly manufactured products. That's correct. For for the majority of our products are brand new, so we're di that distinguishes us from such as Goodwill. Mm -hmm. However, in small categories, we will take used products, and let me give you an example. So in the technology space, we will take computers that have been wiped clean and have right. new hard drives, and the technology is fine. We'll donate those. And in limited um, space in furniture that's used, right. lightly used, we'll repurpose that as a donation. But other than that, they're new goods. Um, what are the bounds of the goods that you will accept? Because goods range from being durable to perishable. We will take everything but food and medicine. At this point, we don't take perishable goods. Mm -hmm. So anything that's useful. So there are times we, you'd be surprised at things that people want to donate. Corporations that may not be useful to a nonprofit at all. We're not in that business. We're in the business of meeting the needs of our nonprofit. So our high need items are things like mattresses, clothes, technology, books, uh, personal care products, home goods, those are all high need goods. So if, if an organization wishes to donate something that you don't need, that won't be a, a consumed product, you won't take that product and then resell it on, no, on the market? No, we don't resell. We, no, we would not do that. That's correct. And you would not take uh, products that um, where the demand has not already been established in your mind. So you're not there to make a market. You're there to fill a need that has already been established. That's correct, but at times if we're uncertain, then we do a poll of our nonprofits and say, do you need this? And sometimes we're uniquely surprised at what we think they may not need that a lot of people will respond. So we don't assume for them. We, we pretty much know what the hot needs are. You know, currently we have millions of diapers. We know that's going to go. That's mm -hmm. a, you know, a really high need product. But there might be something else that we're not sure of, and then we just pull our, we do a survey of our nonprofits. Do the, um, do the manufacturers receive tax breaks for contributing the goods? Yeah, every corporation gets an enhanced tax break 
um, which is on the IRS code 170E3, but I won't go into the details, mm -hmm. but it's essentially, a, it's an enhanced tax break, it's great. For those CFOs that are aware of it, they're very interested in contributing and they will participate. In terms of the organizations that accept these, these, uh, these goods, how do you vet those? Oh, so we make sure, so when you go onto our marketplace, the giving place, you, while you're beginning to shop, so to speak, looking within mm -hmm. our inventory, you know, you have to put in your EIN number, your employee identification number, and we have an API going to GuideStar, which will immediately tell us whether or not you're a legitimate 501c3, have you filed taxes, are you in good standing? And then we have limits to what you can order in the beginning of our relationship with you, and if you want to order larger amounts, such as a truckload, which you can online, we have certain... Um, requirements for that, such as the size of the organization, the size of your revenue. We check out your board, make sure it's not your uncle, Harry, your right. husband, and your second cousin, that in fact you have a legitimate address that's not your own home. Because you know some people, because we don't want goods going to a person's home, they have to go into a warehouse and then be distributed to needy people. And then in terms of what you're funding, how, do, how, how does the funding work? If you're not buying the goods, or you're not uh, spending the preponderance of your funding on purchasing the goods, um, where does your funding, uh, what does your funding go to support? Well, first of all, we have a whole team of people that scout the goods. We have a procurement team, and they don't procure for money, but they procure for donation, which having come out of corporate America, I'll tell you, is 10 times harder than procuring for money. Right. So we have our hunters, so to speak, to find the goods. And so you so, have the, a procurement operation. Right, we have, a procurement, we have a customer service operation, so those, 40,000 charities, there's live chat, there are people on the phone, there's emails. We, we're not you know, going off into cyberspace. We, we're there for our nonprofits. They ordered, they got the wrong thing. It's the wrong size, it Cost came at the wrong time. So there, 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 there's, there's the whole fulfillment process? We have a communications and marketing department. Obviously, we have a finance department. And you have logistics? And we have a whole logistics operation in Omaha, Nebraska. So we have a team of people that run our logistics out of Omaha, Nebraska. And it's both warehouse logistics as well as transportation logistics because you have to get the goods to your your place and then you have to also um, uh, pick, pack, right. ship. Right, we do anywhere from 600 to 1,000 truckloads a year. And we also match charities directly with local retail nonprofits and control those relationships and make sure that they work. So a local, you could be a charity right here in Virginia and go to the local Home Depot and pick up twice a month but we make sure that we do a good match, that people have the right expectations, how the process works. So that's another whole part of our business that we support as well. And from a business operations uh, perspective, your systems need to be as sophisticated as any other um, uh, logistics organization or retail organization. In fact, in certain respects, you need to be even more sophisticated because you're not attaching a particular dollar amount to a particular good, or, or, or are you? Well. We always have to be lean because we're using donated dollars or charitable dollars, which is you answer to a higher order right. of due diligence. So we are extremely lean. You know, Forbes has ranked us as one of the top 10 most efficient charities many years in a row because we have 38 people moving $300 million worth of goods a year. And I've come out of the supply chain world, and when I interviewed for this job, I had to scratch my head as to how we did it because we're extremely lean and we're very, very efficient. So when it, by the time a charity orders a good from our e-commerce platform, The Giving Place, on average, we ship within 48 hours. There are a lot of operations that never ship that fast, and so we do it because we are fast and efficient, and we have very sophisticated logistics back of the house operation. And is the warehouse, is the warehouse operations, is it all in one location? It's, well, we have a few other warehouses for overflow, but we're mainly located in Omaha, Nebraska. And then we just recently were launching in September our new technology which is going to allow nonprofits to create wish lists mm -hmm. and needs and then we'll be able to aggregate those wish lists and push them out to their individual donors who can then crowd fundraise to pay for the shipping and handling and also to our donors to let them know what our nonprofits need. Well oh, that's interesting. So if, if in the future if I'm a donor and I wish to uh, give um, funds to a particular organization, let's say um, uh, Mid Penn Housing in in um, in California, which which provides some affordable housing, uh, it's it's one of the dominant affordable housing uh, players. If I wanted to give, would I be able to um, directly contribute to the logistics entailed in supplying yes. Mid Penn Housing? So let's say Mid Penn goes on and says, "Oh my gosh, your Tempur-Pedic mattresses, we could really use these. This is an incredible investment." Well, it's not in our budget because we weren't aware of it. So right. then Mid Penn Housing can will have a widget 
that goes to us and they'll be able to shoot it out to their people like yourself who believe mm -hmm. in what they do. And the, the micro philanthropist, you may want to give $10, maybe I really believe in it, I give them 100 he gives them 50 And as you aggregate it, it collects and then we drop ship and then we can each download our own personal tax information so we know you gave 10 I gave 100 he gave 50 and it's all individualized. And so this is a brand new capacity for us, opening up to individuals. We've never been able to do that before. Mm -hmm. And the last element to that is we're allowing nonprofits in a very simple format to be able to upload in three steps, videos, stories, and still photographs of the impact of these goods. Mm -hmm. So, and then they'll be pushed out to the donors. So if I'm the Gap and I've donated a truckload of clothing and it's gone off to some boys and girls camp, of impoverished kids and they all hold up their new clothes and they sing a song and what they love and they put it up there, it'll go out to Gap, it'll show up. Everybody gets their own page, every donor gets their own page, so they'll have their own stories. Mm -hmm. And then we hope that the Gap, by example, would be inspired to donate more because they're getting impact stories just in time. How, how did you form? So 31 years ago, the founder was aware that 3M was throwing out several million dollars worth of copying equipment because of a new copier that came out and she was like wow why would you throw it out it's perfectly good it may not be the newest model but this model works fine and so that was where the idea was born she donated that to a charity she was working at united way at the time and then she spun off gifts and kind international which was her old name when i came on board five years ago i changed the brand i changed the name changed the location and the business model somewhat and then i took the organization online but that she created the idea it's it's quite a smart one and how did you come to this to this stage, um, having uh, now being the leader of a philanthropic organization, your career did not start off in philanthropy. No. I had no, um, well, I, I'm an attorney by education, and then I was an attorney for many years with the government, and then I went to a big law firm, Sidley Austin, and practiced law for several years, and I didn't find that very satisfying, because I like to be inside organizations consistently, and you know, as a lawyer, you just sort of, you parachute in, fix a problem, and leave. And then I became the chief employment counsel for Giant Food in this area. And there was, in a sister company, U.S. Food Service became, had a billion dollar fraud, part of Royal Ahold, and they grabbed me and they made me the first chief ethics and compliance officer. And I loved that job. I had it for years. And then I became head of sustainability and head of communications as the fraud went away and their entire- All in U.S. Foods? All U.S. Foods. You know, my position kept growing as we left the fraud in the dust. But then they closed down their Columbia, Maryland offices, moved to Chicago, and there I was at 52 years old saying, what next? And a good friend of mine said to me, and I had four kids and parents in the area was about to move, and she said to me, everything about you says you should run a nonprofit. And I had never thought about it. I was on a couple of nonprofit boards, so I'd been on, involved in nonprofits, and then I went to lunch with someone, they said this job was open, and I thought, wow, supply chain. <laughs> I spent my life in supply chain. I didn't even know there were nonprofits that did sophisticated supply chains this makes sense to me and I think because I was such an unusual candidate they they told me that that my resume just stuck out because I wasn't the typical candidate I didn't have a nonprofit background have you found your um, your career in the nonprofit sector to be easier than oh, no in the... no 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 much harder it's the hardest job I've ever why had. is it harder because I've had very interesting careers but I never had to worry about money. You know, when I was at U.S. Food Service and they were in the middle of a billion dollar fraud, you know, there, I had a, we used to say the rich, you know, Dutch uncle from the Netherlands who supplied us enough resources to help clean up the fraud. Right. So I've always, and then at U.S. Food Service, you know, I've always had where money was never an issue. In the nonprofit world, money's always an issue. And if it's not front and center in your mind, you shouldn't be a nonprofit leader. And, and you don't get to accumulate uh, reserves in the nonprofit sector. You're 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 basically trying to figure out a way to use very scarce resources this right. year to benefit people, and then next year it's a it's just a new year. It's just a new year, and it's a new challenge. So, it's a very different. You know, it's my. I met a guy that was had a very successful uh, business career, and they went on to run a nonprofit. And we both agreed there's nothing harder than running a nonprofit. Nothing is, it, hard is it fulfilling? Oh, it's very fulfilling. And I would argue that the most interesting people I've ever met in my life, I've met in the last five years. And the most work is the most interesting. So there are lots of benefits. It's just not easy. It's hard. 
In terms of the next chapter for this organization, Good360 has gone through a considerable transformation uh, since you've come in. You've rebranded, you've moved, you've done all sorts of different things. What is the next chapter for Good360? Well, we recently in January won Verizon's Powerful Answers Award in the Sustainability ca category for our Disaster Recovery 360. So we're in the process of putting together a new disaster recovery platform. There are lots of people in the disaster recovery space. The ones you know of the most obvious ones are people like the Red Cross, Red Cross et cetera. Yeah. They're first responders. But what most people, Americans in particular, I can speak to, they look at disasters within the first few weeks, and the research shows that within the first six weeks of a disaster, 80% of the funds are given, right. and it takes on average three years to fix a disaster. So the lights go out, the media goes home, and people forget about people. And then there's right. people like CNN and other news outlets that when it's a year up, they come back every year and say, how's it going? But there's 12 and a half months between when they're coming again. So what we believe that what happens in the beginning of disasters, people are throwing lots of goods at a problem, and they're the wrong goods at the wrong people, and they right. clog up the supply chain. Setting so, up soup can, cans uh, right. for, for a disaster instead of money, for example. Well, instead of money or instead of batteries or, or tents or blankets or whatever the needs are. So we're creating an app that we hope to load up on Verizon phones. That was our partner mm -hmm. who gave us the award. We're still working out those details, whether that's possible and that we're able to make sure that the right goods that go to the right people at the right time by having the technology that will empower a nonprofit on the ground to type in just in time what they need, when they need it, the first day, the first week, the first month, the first year, and keep going, and then we'll aggregate those needs and keep pushing them out to our donors and keep their requests alive, their voices alive to get the right goods continuing throughout the recovery process. So you're actually creating a just in time uh, process where as the need arises, the individuals uh, can report back on what they need. Uh, you can then consolidate that information and create a, a, a rational supply chain um, out of that. That's correct. And it's a very, it, it's a very sort of minimal fuss and bother approach. You're just doing this, in a, a, it is a sustainable business model. Um, but that, it's complicated because complicated. It, there's a lot of people wanting to help, a lot of companies wanting to help. And one of the things we have with the 40,000 nonprofit network is if you really think you want to send concrete and concrete's the last thing this disaster needs, I can show you 180 nonprofits that could probably use concrete in the rebuilding process now. So we'll get you to one of those. You may not be in the disaster du jour area, right. but we, we can repurpose it somewhere else. And, and people are very appreciative of that because the worst thing is the other dirty little secret people don't know is 60% of product donations at the time of disaster end up in landfills. 60% is appalling. Which, which creates another problem. Right, now you get an environmental disaster, so. Well, Cindy, thank you so much for sharing some of this intelligence with us and this very unique business model. And thank you so much for your insights. Well, thank you, I enjoyed it.